Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar this evening. Um, I'm Shane Gebauer. I'm the general manager of Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. Uh, again, I'd like to welcome you all this evening and really thank you for coming. Um, I, I can't tell you how excited I am uh, this evening because we've got uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp, who's the uh, assistant research scientist at the University of Maryland. And I've been trying for some time to uh, recruit him to, uh, to get in on one of these webinars, and I finally have been successful. Uh, Dennis is, is one of the, the I think, and, and he, he may be humble and disagree with this, but he's one of the, the, the leading researchers in our industry. Uh, he's doing a lot of great research that is uh, applicable to our everyday beekeeping practices. Certainly the research uh, that takes place in laboratories uh, is important, but I think we all really appreciate things, messages that we can take from research and apply it to our everyday beekeeping practices. And Dennis is one of the people that has really been leading that front, I think. And uh, I, I can't thank him enough for being here this evening to talk to us about the Be Informed Partnership and, and how uh, important this, this program is, this project is, uh, to the industry and how you all can help that partnership. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dennis. Dennis, uh, the floor, so to speak, is all yours. Thanks, Shane, um, and thanks everyone for being here. I'm excited about this because it's my first webinar. I've tried to do some Skype ones before. I'm not sure that they worked all that well. But this webinar is really interesting and really exciting, so I'm, I'm glad to do it, and I think this might change how I do some presentations. So your feedback about how it went would be appreciated at the end. Um, I usually rely on, on seeing visual clues from my audience, so I can't do that obviously this time, but I think we'll make do um, and uh, we'll, we'll get going. Um, so what I'm talking about today is the Be Informed Partnership. This is a large USDA NIFA grant that was awarded last May to a large group of us, and it's an extension grant, and that's really important because what we're doing is not necessarily primary research. Our primary objective is to extend information to beekeepers. And what we really are doing is we're applying human, the tools that human epidemiologists use and applying that to, to the, the bee management to figure out what management practices work and which don't and get that information back to beekeepers. Now the Bee Informed pr pr Partnership is really, if we boil it down, really is about three, has, is based on three different principles. The first is that the challenges facing the apiary industry are very complex and they're unprecedented. And that's clear, that we've had a lot of problems in the industry and they're complex problems. The second uh, premise is the fact that some of the answers are out there. There are beekeepers who are succeeding. So there are some successful beekeepers out there. So the answers to these complex answers, the, the, it's an answerable question, how to overcome our problems. And the third part is that nobody listens to anybody. And I think that if we're all honest with ourselves, um, when we, 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 we listen to people, unless their experience sort of resonates with ours, we're not very likely to listen to what they have to say. So let's go into um, a, little, a couple of details here. First though, I'd like to ask the question, how many people, this is an instant poll, how many people participated in last year's winter loss survey? Uh, I'm just going to launch a poll here real quick uh, to help out with that. Let me launch this. So this is a, a poll you can just answer yes or no. And uh, this will just help us uh, a little bit go through this to, uh, to gain an understanding of, of you folks out there. We've got 52% in, 60%, 65. Just choose one of those, yes or no. Did you participate in the winter loss? We've got uh, just about 80%, and I'm going to close this poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and I'm going to close this poll. Let me just go ahead and show you the results here, Dennis. Can we see that? We've got um, we've got 34% said yes and 66% said no. Okay. Well, that's 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 useful to know, and I I hope that one of my objectives for doing this is that I'll convince you 
those who haven't participated in the survey to participate in this year's upcoming survey because I think that we can get a lot of information from it. But basically, uh, the Winter Law Survey is a project that's been done by the USDA and the Apiary Inspectors of America for five years. And for the last five winters, we've recorded on average 30% of all the colonies in the country dying every winter. And that's an astronomical number. Can you imagine if, if dairy farmers or corn producers lost 30% of their crop every year? It's unheard of. Now, beekeepers have been able to mask those losses because, of course, what we can do is if we have a dead colony and a live colony, we can split that live colony in half, add a queen, and replace that colony. And so they've been able to overcome these losses so that even though they lose 30% of their colonies every winter, the actual the number of managed colonies come August has been about the same or risen slightly over those last five years. That's not to say that that 33% isn't significant and doesn't have some real cost to beekeepers. But if we look at the data a little bit differently, um, what you can see is that there, the, 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 the losses aren't the same. So if we look at this graph, this is the number of beekeepers, and in this case we're only talking about commercial beekeepers, the number of beekeepers that lost different proportions of their hive. And so you can see that the average is indeed at about 30%, but there's a wide distribution. And so um, what you, if you look at this graph over here, what we can see is that 25% of beekeepers lost fewer than 14% of their operation where 25% of beekeepers lost 14%, less, fewer than 14% of the operation. And 14% is considered an acceptable loss by beekeepers. And so this is a reasonable loss. But another 25% of beekeepers lost 53% or more of their operation. So clearly these guys are doing something that they're losing a lot of colonies. This is not sustainable. And so what we want to know, in essence, is what's different between these guys who are losing a large number of their colonies and those that are losing fewer than 14% of their colonies. And can we figure out what those differences are and help those beekeepers who are losing a lot of colonies lose fewer colonies? And this could really have a large impact. If we were to able to just that top 25% that lost 53% or more of their colonies, if we were able to reduce their losses by half, it would have saved 86,000 extra colonies in our survey population, which would have had a value in pollination for almonds of $1.29 million. And so this is a real, real, uh, we can really see a lot of advantages by emphasizing on trying to get people to reduce their losses, especially that top 25%. So let's talk a little bit about what I meant by nobody listening to anybody. And so I want to just let, imagine that you know a fisherman or you're a fisherman yourself. And so you fish, and you fish all your life, you've fished with worms. And you've been very good at fishing, you're happy with your fish, you know, everything is good. And then along comes an extension agent giving a webinar and suggests that you fish with frogs. And no doubt you're polite, and so you'll nod your head polite, and you'll think about it. Just think really, well, I've fished with worms all my life. Why would I want to fish with frogs? Until, of course, you see your neighbor who's been fishing with frogs, and you see what he's caught. And so I think that this idea that we listen when the truth resonates with us or when we're learning from the experience of others we know is basically the extension philosophy behind the Be Informed Partnership. And so basically it has a formal name, which is it's an engages stakeholder empowerment. And so the idea is that we get information from beekeepers and give it back to beekeepers in as undigested form as possible so they can make informed decisions about their management practices. So how do we want to do this? Basically, what we want to do is we have a whole bunch of different surveys. So we have a management and winter loss survey, which I'm going to talk about some of the results in a moment. 
and which we're going to be conducting again uh, at the end of this week for a three-week period. We also have in-field surveys where we're actually collecting data in-field, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. We also have different data from a bunch of different data sources, which I'll talk about later on in this, in this talk. And we put that into a database. And this database is meant to be very comprehensive, gathering information from all these different sources, packaging it up, and then getting the information back to you, the beekeeper, in various ways. And one of those ways is our management survey, which I want to talk about right now. And so when we look at the management survey, this is the management survey done last year. You can see we had just over 3,000 respondents. Most of those were backyard beekeepers, which kept less than, um, less than 50 hives. We also had some commercial beekeepers, of course. They, they had over 500 colonies. And we had sideline beekeepers who kept between 50 and 500 colonies. And you can see they lost different levels of, of worker, about 30% loss last year. Now, one of our real concerns is how few commercial beekeepers we had. Our eventual goal is to be able to give results based on your size of operation, because we realize that beekeepers that keep a large number of colonies are going to have much different management techniques than beekeepers who have fewer colonies. So what's appropriate for a large beekeeper is not necessarily appropriate for a small beekeeper, and vice versa. Another thing that's very important to do is that we have to regionalize this data. And in order for us to do that, we need to have a large number of beekeepers in each region so that we can extract the data. So if we have at least three to 500 respondents per state, we'll be able to report losses at the state level and management, particular management techniques at the state level. But one of the clear things last year was there's a very big difference in losses between northern states, that's in the blue here. Northern states lost on average 40% of their colonies, where beekeepers operating in southern states lost about 25% of their colonies. And so that, that was significantly different. I do want to introduce a very important concept here, and that's confidence intervals. You can see these lines here. This is not the standard error bar, but the confidence interval. Basically, if the confidence intervals overlap, so two confidence intervals side by side, and they overlap, the means are not different. So you can't look at there being a difference between those two populations. But as is in the case here, where the confidence intervals don't overlap, then the populations are different. And you can clearly see that if we look at this graph here, um, there were different average losses across the state. The Northeast had particularly high levels of loss last winter. And again, we want to see what happens this winter um, with our winter loss survey that we're going to conduct starting next week. So one of the, the things that we're doing beyond the winter loss survey is our uh, management survey. And so we can ask various questions. One of the questions we asked is we list a whole bunch of known varroa mite product, control products, and we ask, did you use any of these products in the last 12 months? And so for any of the known varroa mite control products, so that means your apistan, your check mite, uh, formic acid products, apolifar, apigar, and so on, we asked, did you use any of those? And those people who did, surprisingly, only 39% of beekeepers indicated they used a varroa mite control product in the last 12 months. And that was astonishing to me, at least, because we've been saying that varroa mites are enemy number one for a very long time. And only 40%, just under 40% of beekeepers said they used the product. But those who did use the product lost significantly fewer colonies than those that did not use a known varroa mite control product. In fact, People who used the varroa mite control product lost 25% fewer colonies on average than those who didn't. So from an epidemiological point of view, this is a huge difference. Those dramatic differences, especially considering how variable this data is and how dirty this data is, that's an incredibly strong indicator. And as a beekeeper, if I look at that data, it makes me realize that I probably should be thinking about doing something to control varroa mites in my colony. We can also break down the data according to the type of varroa mite control product used. So if you look at these two products, which is Apigard 
and Apolife Var. These are thymol-based products. And here what we can see is the blue bars are this product was used. The red bar is when some other type of varroa mite control product was used. And the yellow bar is for when no known varroa mite control product was used. And what you can see is both Apigard and Apolife Var were very were good products. They in fact, you the people who use these products lost fewer colonies, not only fewer colonies than those who didn't use any product at all, but people who used another known varroa mite control product. So these were very good products generally last year. Now it's very important to realize that this is epidemiological data. So we can't say the APIGARD increased long in, in decreased decreased the number of colonies lost, all we can say is those who used it had fewer colonies lost on average than those who don't. We assume that's because these products are being used to control rural mite control products, but we don't know that necessarily from the data. Another product that did, did, did come out as being a reasonable rural mite control was a formic acid product. I will remind the audience that the, this new mite away quick strip is available this coming season, but wasn't available last season, so we, did, we didn't measure its effectiveness last year. And another product that people sometimes use is sucrocide. We found no evidence that sucrocide had any impact on colony survivorship. So one of the things that I really am hoping you guys are, are thinking about doing is going to the beinformed.org website and there's a button sign up to participate and when you sign up to participate you'll get an email that tells you when the next survey starts so that you can participate in it. And I'll get back to this point in a little bit. Another question we asked the beekeepers was did you feed any carbohydrates? And so carbohydrates we mean any sugar, high fructose corn syrup, any product like that. And certainly most beekeepers, over 90% of beekeepers, use the carbohydrate. Um, and certainly feeding colonies or providing feed to colonies is an essential part of any management technique um, in terms of managing your colonies. But those who used and did not use didn't lose any different amount of colonies over the winter. One interesting thing is that when we looked at the type of carbohydrate product used was that for all the other, for sucrose, sucrose, for high fructose corn syrup, for any of those there was no difference between people who used that product or used another carbohydrate source except for those who indicated that they fed their colonies um, honey, frames of honey. And for those people who used frames of honey, they lost significantly more colonies than those who used another carbohydrate source. Now again, I want to emphasize this, you can't say it's because of the frames of honey that they had increased mortality. There might be another explanation. For instance, perhaps people who lost a lot of colonies had more frames of honey to feed their colonies. And so it might not be a direct relationship. But this is suggestive. And so what we have to do is we have to see if this trend continues in the future. And if it does, we have to try to figure out what the cause of this trend is. Certainly my take home message from this is that I would think twice about feeding my colonies frames of honey as the principal source of feed. Um, any honey that's in there of course is okay, but as, as supplementing it with frames of honey is something that as a beekeeper I would think twice about. Another result that really jumped out at us was small hive beetle traps. Small hive beetle traps, this was especially true in northern states, the people who use small hive beetle traps in the blue bar lost significantly fewer colonies than those who did not use small hive beetle traps. Now this does beg the question, well why would that be? And again, we can't really say that it's the small hive beetle trap. It could be that people using small hive beetle traps are just better beekeepers than those who don't use small hive beetle traps. And so they're doing all these other management techniques more efficiently. That brings up a very important point that what we're doing is we're just looking at one factor at a time in this analysis. Next year, if we have enough participation, we can look at multiple factors at the same time and see what they do because surely some of these different factors are interacting with each other.
But back to this point, that the people who use small high beetle traps lost fewer colonies than, or people who lost, used small ideal traps lost fewer colonies than those who didn't, may also suggest that perhaps small hive beetles are doing something to the cluster and stressing that colony out. The fact that this was more pronounced in northern states means that maybe small hive beetles are having trouble or are disturbing the cluster in the winter, causing this increased mortality. And that's again something we want to see again in this next year's survey to validate that. And if it does, we can do some experiments to try to figure out what the underlying cause is. Another question we asked um, was, was when beekeepers came across a dead colony and you found a dead colony, what did you do? And beekeepers really have two choices. One is that they can get a live colony and split that live colony into the dead, dead out equipment, or they can take that equipment and store it until next year or at another time and use it to establish a new colony. What we found was those who immediately reused the equipment by making a split or for, with some other reason did not lose any more or fewer colonies than those who didn't um, store their equipment or do otherwise. However, those who stored equipment lost significantly more colonies than those who did not store equipment. And so this is a very, this, this really surprised me and I don't understand what the mechanism is behind this, and certainly that's not what this study is meant to do. But it does make you wonder about what might be happening in that stored equipment. And certainly if we see this trend continue in another year of survey, this would certainly be an avenue that we should look at in terms of trying to figure out well, what, is, what is driving this difference. Of course, we can also ask about beekeepers um, making increases. So we, if people bought hives, they didn't lose fewer or more colonies. Installed swarms didn't lose more or colonies. Those people who split, not quite significant, but those who made splits nearly lost fewer colonies than those who didn't. But certainly those who used packages lost more colonies on average than those who didn't. Um, and so that's just... Now, again, I have to say that we can't say anything about packages per se. It could be that just people who bought packages were more likely to be new beekeepers, and so we're more inexperienced, and that's what's driving this difference. But again, we want to look at this with a couple more years' data to figure out what's driving this trend. I think this is the last sort of just, I'm really summing up about 238 different data files that we have, um, just trying to pick out some highlights. And one of the questions we also asked was, where were your colonies next to different crops? One of the things we did find was that beekeepers who kept colonies, or said they kept colonies close to corn when they were making honey, lost more colonies than those who did not indicate they were near corn. And similarly, those who said that they were near cranberries lost more colonies than those than that were not near cranberries. So the beeinformed.org partnership, um, I want to just go over quickly here to, uh, to this website and show you what you can do at this website. So if you go to our beeinformed.org website, you can see this is the sign up to participate logo where you can click on it, and I hope you do, to sign up and participate if you didn't participate in future years. But you can also see a couple of different things. First of all, we have our blog. And at our blog, every week, we have different members of our team add results. I also will be giving blogs where I talk about the results and very short little snippets and vlogs that we post here. Um, and so you can go there to see some of the interpretation of the results. But if you really want to get down and dirty with the results, click our results page. And what you can do is you can click on on, on our survey release, and you can look at individual, um, individual reports so that you can compare different losses, and it gives you all the different details. And so the idea here is to give you as much information as possible while still protecting the confidentiality of the people participating in this survey, and also the idea is that we want to highlight the most important factors and then eventually give um, um, uh, summary of what those important factors are. 
So feel free to browse those reports at your leisure. We're releasing batches of them once every two to three weeks, and so you should expect to see more. Uh, we expect some more release by the end of the week. Dennis, um, one thing that I, 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 we've had a couple of questions um, about the, the survey. Now, you, you just took us to the site where we can sign up, but the survey's not open yet, is it? That, that's right. The survey will be opened on March 30th for a three-week period. And, and why is it that you only open it for a, a window? Well, in part, it's because good survey, we want to have, we want to define the time frame that the survey is encompassing. So when we calculate winter losses, we want to make sure, we call, it, we call it winter losses, but really it's from October till March 30th. So October 1st to March 30th is what we consider our winter period. And so we want to encompass that so that we're, we're always have the same time frame for which period the losses occur. And also, if you look at the research behind surveys, it's better to do a survey at the same period of time for a limited period of time than scattered throughout. In future years, we're going to do a quarterly survey with a select few beekeepers to try to track a couple of other things as well. But for now, our management survey is just our annual national winter loss and management survey. And um, a, a, a couple other questions. You, you mentioned a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, do you, I'm sort of jumping the gun here, but no, I'll, I'll let you. Well, uh, you mentioned the uh, when showing some of those reports, sort of uh, the issue of confidentiality. Um, I know that uh, that's a huge issue for uh, uh, people nowadays with uh, you know sharing of information, privacy data, etc. Can you speak a little bit to that? I mean, if I were to go and fill out this survey, what what happens to that information? How do I know that you're not using it uh, with with malicious intent? Right. Okay. A really good question. And I first should say, and I'll introduce, I'll mention this at the end of the talk, that we have a medical epidemiologist as part of our team, and so we're really taking notes on how they protect patient doctor information. And we're using some of the same tools to protect our participants. So we use a very encrypted system of keeping the data together. Also, the surveys, unless you give us permission to link the survey data with your email address, then we have no way of knowing who has answered the, the question. So that's another way we do it, that you can decide to be totally anonymous, and you're free to do that um, so that there's no linkage at all. We do encourage you to put your email there because that way we can link data from year to year, but we do that through a, a number system. So we really go out of our way to make sure that no one, not even us, that we can identify who the beekeeper is giving the information um, and their results. The second thing that we do, of course, is we only give out data that's summed up. We would never give individual line item data unless that person has gone through extensive training and confidentiality training. So we really do try, it's a real priority of us is to protect the confidentiality of the people responding to the survey. Great. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at all. It's a good point. A lot of people ask that and I should have, I should have mentioned that earlier. So one of the really exciting projects that we also have going on is these tech transfer teams. Our first tech transfer team was established in Northern California with the queen producers out there. These queen producers with the Hawaii queen producers produce over half of the queens that are made in this country. And this project was initiated by Marla Spivak, um, and who we have there is Mike Andre, Rob Snyder, who, 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 who used to be with me at Penn State University and I moved to California, and Katie Lee, who was Marla Spivak student and has moved to California. Um, I will say this idea of a tech transfer team is now getting, is, is expanding and we're going to start one in the Midwest that Katie is going to start sort of serving the Dakotas. And basically what this team does is we realize that beekeepers, especially these large beekeepers, are very busy. And so what we do is we go in and we help collect data on disease levels for these beekeepers and get it back to them in a quick way. We also do tests like the hygienic behavior test 
where with liquid nitrogen we freeze a circle of brood and then put that brood back into the colony in 24 hours, we come back and we count how much brood has been removed. Obviously this top circle here, that is very hygienic and we know that hygienic behavior is linked with increased varroa mite resistance and resistance to other diseases. And so highly hygienic queens are probably going to be have healthier, be, have healthier colonies than co queens that are not highly hygienic. And so by giving this information to bee breeders, they're very good. Bee breeders, the queen breeders we have in this country are the best of the best. They're exceptionally good beekeepers, but they're also very busy. And by giving this information to them, we think that they're going to start making decisions based also not on just the temperament and productivity of these colonies, but also all things being equal, they're going to take those colonies that have less disease problems. And so by doing that, we're hoping to improve sort of the, the entire national stock of bees, that they're more resilient to disease. We, the, the idea here, though, is that we, we do a cost recovery program, and so we very, are very keen on the idea of having the beekeepers contribute to these, these teams and therefore be able to expand these teams across the country. And so we're expanding to the Midwest this year. Hopefully next year we'll expand to the Southeast um, and so on across the country so they can have a real impact and work one-on-one -on -one with groups of beekeepers um, to, to help them make management decisions. Um, I want to go back to the slide I talked about earlier is the other types of data we have. So one of the things is the USDA Beltsville, Jeff Pettis' lab in, or in the Beltsville Bee Lab, they have done um, disease diagnostics for, for 20 years. And so what we've been able to do is scan all that data and put it in our database. Also some of you may be knowing about the APHIS National Honeybee Disease Survey um, that uh, we've been involved in. And all the data from that also is going into this database. I don't know if any of you guys are, have used HiveTrax, but HiveTrax is a great tool for um, um, keeping records of what you do in your colonies. And we're, the, the, the team that's done that is also the team creating our database. And so we're going to link tightly with HiveTrax in order to use that as a data collection tool. And also the Honeybee Net, which used to be hosted by NASA, is now being hosted by the Bee Inform Partnership. And it basically takes satellite da data and looks at temperatures and, and different climatic conditions and scale data, basically hives on scales and how much honey a colony gains and loses in a day um, for the whole course of the year to predict management techniques. So when colonies are likely to swarm and do different things. And so we're collecting all this data to eventually help you make management decisions. We'll also be collecting data on individual levels of nosema and varroa. And so how we're going to use it, for instance, when you get a report from APHIS, you know, a lot of people talk about, say, nosema. And the fact is, is that we don't know a lot about what nosema serrana does or what level is important. But because we now have this database, what we can do is say, well, you had a nosema level of you know, 1 million spores per bee. Well, we found that that 1 million spores per bee, if we look at all the data we have on Nosema serrana, that's at about the 40th percentile in your region. And so the idea is to give these numbers context as compared to any other disease levels found in your area. And so I think this is going to be a very powerful tool because it will help you make more informed decisions based on um, the levels of disease that are found in your area um, through all these other efforts that have been incorporated into our database. I want to conclude by saying we have a really great team. We have a lot of diverse people on this team. Jeff Pettis at the USDA Beltsville Lab. John Skinner in Tennessee is one of our extension experts. Um, James Wilkes is a computer scientist and beekeeper at Appalachia State. Um, and he does some really great work on the database. Um, Dave Tarpey, who I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, professor at uh, North Carolina State, he does our virus analysis, his lab does our virus analysis. Myself now at the University of Maryland. Eugene Langridge is actually at the Hershey Medical School. He's our epidemiologist and so gives us a lot of guidance on using epidemiological tools. Marla Spivak, I'm sure a lot of you know, 
University of Minnesota um, does some really great work with hygienic bees and breeding bees that are resistant. Jerry Hayes, who was with the Florida Department of Agriculture, um, acts as sort of a consultant because he has a really good pulse on the field. Keith Delaplane at the University of Georgia, a, a well-known bee scientist. Um, we have Kathy Bayless, who's an economist. One of the things that I haven't mentioned is in the future years, we're also going to look at the cost of treating and, and to sort of give you an idea whether treating makes economic sense or not. Is the cost benefit of treating good or not? Um, he's joined by Dr. Gross um, from California. We have two other extension experts in California, Wayne Esaias with NASA, and then Robin Rose, who is with APHIS. But of course, those are the people who are sort of the, 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 the principal investigators. And this is the group of people who really do the work in the field. Karen Rennick in the middle is the project manager, which is code that she manages me. And she does a really excellent job with keeping things on track. We have, I've already introduced Mike and Rob, who are part of the team in California. Sure, Devi is in North Carolina State doing the molecular analysis. Um, I should say that we generate this, so far this year, we generate about three, th three to 5,000 samples collected in the field for Varroa mite and Nosema analysis. And all of those samples get sent here to, to Maryland in the USDA Beltsville Lab, where we have a great team of people doing analysis, including Heather, Jenny, um, and some other people who aren't listed here. Um, we have some grad students working on different aspects. Mark Henson really should be congratulated. He doesn't always dress like a cat, but he really should be congratulated on doing a great job with our database. Michael Wilson at Tennessee is great at our website designing. And then Robin Rose, or sorry, Robin Underwood does a lot of our editing stuff. So we have a really great team that I'm really pleased with. So I'm going to finish with this. Before I take questions, we're going to do our last poll. And that poll is, is how many of you, now that you've seen what we're going to do, are going to commit to doing our survey this coming year? So I'll give it over to Shane to run you through that. Uh, how's it going, Shane? Are you there, Shane? Oh, I'm sorry. I had I I muted myself to av <laughs> to avoid echo. I've been talking to myself for the past right. seconds. I'm sorry. The poll is launched, but I just wanted to say that I had the oh. pleasure of learning a little bit more about this project out in Las Vegas when I heard you speak out there at the uh, the American Beekeeping Federation meeting. It was back in January, and we've talked a, a bit since then, and and really. This I can't stress this enough, and I know we've got some people here this evening that are, are leaders in their respective areas. We've got people that are in uh, the New York State beekeepers, in the Massachusetts beekeepers, in the North Carolina beekeepers. I mean, these are leaders in their, their, their particular states or regions, locations. This has real value for beekeepers, but the, the more we can get uh, for people, more people we can get to sign up for this and participate in this, the more valuable and robust the results are going to be. And, and I think, Dennis, it's safe to say that really you scratch the surface in terms of what's available out there and the results that are being generated from this. You mentioned something like 200 and some odd reports. Is that, is that right? Yeah, so, so when all is said and done this year, we'll have released 200 and se two, over 200 reports. I won't remember the number exactly. Um, but again, these are just monofactorial reports. So only, okay, did you use this or did you not use this? I think it really gets exciting when we start looking at regional effects. Like what's best for North Carolina? What's best for California? What's working best in Minnesota? And I think for that to happen, we need a lot more responses at the regional level, at least 300 respondents to make any meaningful comparison. Because remember, there's a lot of challenges with beekeeping. There's a lot of complexities that we have to address. The other thing that's going to get exciting is when we look at, did you feed and did you treat for Varroa mite at the same time? Like, What are the variables there? How do these variables contribute to the success? 
Also the timing of the treatment. When did you apply the treatment? And so as we grow this data set, the more information we have in there, the more people participate, the more information we can get back to beekeepers. So when I highlighted these, these findings here, these were the biggest, most pronounced findings we found. There's a lot more information there, but to be sure that we're being accurate there, we need a lot more people to uh, participate. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, and we've got 82% of the folks that are listening right now that have, have responded. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll in three, two, one, and we'll close that poll, and I'm going to just share it with everyone. We've got about 90% say they're going to uh, participate in the winter survey this year. So um, we, uh, that's, that's great. That that is great. Um, one of the 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 ads that I I saw in one of the magazines, or or maybe it was in a slide uh, in a presentation that I saw that you were giving, again, sort of alluded to the point that. The answers are out there. The beekeepers have the answers, um, but we just need to get them to to participate in this, so that all that information that's out there in the heads of of the beekeepers can sort of be distilled down to generate some of the results that we've seen here tonight. And it's really it's it's really exciting. I've I, it like I said at the the onset, um, there hasn't been. Uh, anything in a long time that's sort of gotten me as jazzed up as as this. So um, anyway, I, I would encourage people to to uh, to uh, participate in that. But enough um, enough about that. Let me uh, pull up our questions panel um, because we've got a lot of questions uh, here for you this evening, Dennis, and we've got some time for those. So I'd like to pose these to you. The first. Um, is is a question I, I'm assuming they saw the latest uh, information in in uh, ABJ and B culture where um, they noted a relationship between uh, the use of a varroa product um, with lower hive losses uh, what jumped off the page at me however was the relationship between lower mortality and the mean number of colonies the larger colony numbers, i.e. commercial beekeepers, had lower mortality rates. Was the data normalized for other factors such as geography? It occurs to me that most commercial beekeepers are in southern states where winter is more mild. And so might that also be influencing yeah. the that trend that you talked about where northern states had uh, a harder winter in terms of losses, southern states had an easier winter in terms of losses, but we've got more commercial beekeepers in the south that may be more right. more experienced. Right. No, and that's that's a really good point. And if you actually go to the results page, you can see it split up by people who keep bees multi-regional. Those are the migratory beekeepers, southern states, and northern states. Um, we do do treat the data because it's average data, and we have over a thousand respondents. We can assume normality because it's it's just a Poisson distribution thing for those who are out there. But you can assume normality. So we do look at normality of the data. I will also say you're right that there was a difference there. But by far and large, the people who kept larger numbers of colonies were more likely to treat than those who didn't. So again, it, it, I think that that's a function of of the big beekeepers can't experience these losses, and experience has shown them that they need to treat. Um, also, we're talking about averages losses here, not total losses. So total losses would be the total number of colonies lost. Averages, no matter if you're big or small, you only represent one, your, your average loss is your average loss, and so it's represented equally compared to everybody. So, so, so if I'm a commercial beekeeper that's got 5,000 hives, and right. I fill out this survey and say I, I lost 33% of, of my colonies, that's right. still one data point as and, and treated the same as if I'm a, a, a backyard beekeeper that has three colonies and I lost 33% of my operation. Those two in the data set are essentially the same. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, very close to the same, yes. Yeah, they are treated exactly the same for, you're right, they're treated exactly the same in terms of a monofactorial analysis of did you treat or did you not treat? What was your average loss? Might the, that's why we need to break it up into commercial sideline and backyard beekeepers. But for right. that to happen, we need a lot more backyard. We need a lot more uh, sideline and commercial beekeepers to respond. Right. 
Um, there's a couple questions here about sort of the division between north and, and south um, and, and sort of where, what distinguishes whether you're a northern beekeeper or southern beekeeper. Right. Is there uh, anything? Right. So uh, let me go to the web page again because I think that that's answered right, right there. So if we go to the results section, we can look at um, the respondents. And if we look by losses by region, you can see the report, and then you can see what considers a northern state, what's considered okay. a southern state. Um, and it's so uh, can, these these are, are you're on the website. These are there now for right. folks to, to look at. That's right. So that was so how we got there was we were at the, the, the home page when you go to beinformed.org, you go to results, and you can see being national management respondents. And so here we have a bunch of releases. So, so far we've released the respondents, so you get an idea of who responded to the survey and what their losses are, and for all my control techniques, um, I'm just finishing um, use of antibiotics, nosema, honeybee trait for my control, and then feed, feed additives, carbohydrate and protein feed. So that, would, we expect those out next week. Okay. Um, there's there's several questions here asking about sort of particular things. You know, did you did you look at this like uh, uh, essential oils? Did you include top bar hives? What products do you did you include? Can you just sort of touch on some of the 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 main uh, questions? And and it's, I guess it's important to note that those questions about what you use to treat your hive or whether you fed. That's sort of a the management survey, which is this year. It's all sort of one and the same, but it's it's sort of a different set of questions. Is that right? Well, how we did it last year, we had a winter loss survey and a management survey, but some of the questions overlap. Mm -hmm. So this year, the first, it's basically it'll be a, a twenty. I don't know anyone who's going to take half an hour for. We're saying it's a half an hour survey. Probably takes fifteen minutes. The first four to five minutes are the winter loss survey. And then you can opt to continue in the management survey. That way you don't have to repeat the same questions. And then we have these management questions that ask things like, in which months did you apply? And then we list a whole bunch of different products. You can see here the management survey 2010-2011. You can actually see our questions. So you can actually see the questions that we asked last year. Um, we didn't ask the top bar high question. We're doing that this year. And so if enough people make a comment or indicate, we always give a people the option other, and then they can write something in. And if we get at least 10 to 20 respondents, then we'll add it in subsequent questions uh, in, in questionnaires. But you hit a very important part. It's nearly impossible to write a survey that encompasses every single thing beekeepers do, because we know beekeepers are very creative, and they use a whole host of different things to answer their questions. But we try to give room for that, and if we see enough respondents, we add it in subsequent years. Great. Um, there's um, there's someone here that uh, uh, apparently filled out last year's, and will the the same questions be asked this year? If not, what new questions are going to be asked? Um, yeah, so Good. Yeah. So, so most of the questions are the same. We're asking them a little bit differently so that you can skip over non-pertinent questions because that was a frustration for people last year where they didn't use a product and they, they started out and said didn't use, didn't use an awful lot. So basically you can go from question 30 to question 80 in one step if you indicated you didn't use some products. We've added a couple more economic questions and we've sort of tried to refine some of our questions Sort of, for instance, we didn't ask what dose or how many times you treated a colony. We just asked, did you treat the colony or not? This year, we're going to go after a little bit more of the dosing because I think some of our results will become more clear. So, for instance, drone brood removal. We know from experiments that drone brood removal helps reduce varroa mite, but we saw no indication that improved survivorship. And so, by asking how many times did you remove drone brood, um, and how frequently, perhaps, we'll be able to tease out an effect. So we're trying to become more precise. Um, here's a question from uh, someone that wants to, more information about the uh, the Hive Scale program. Um, 
can you speak about that a little bit? Because that's pretty interesting, especially it, this year with our sort of abnormal spring that we're having here. Um, I know that uh, Wayne has, has found some pretty interesting results with that, but can you talk about the Hive Scale program a bit? Well, I, I think that I think it would be great to get Wayne on here. And if you go to their website, which um, was in that last slot, which what is it? The Honeybee. Sorry, let me. Honey, Honeybee Net. Yeah, Honeybee Net. Um, I would go to the Honeybee Net and and see the information there. One of the limited you can so if you can buy a scale and you can do this and participate and add data to this database. One of the things that we're hoping to do, these scales, especially the electronic ones that collect the data automatically, tend to be fairly expensive. So one of our projects this coming year is to try to source a way of perhaps getting some of these scales and making them available to different clubs so that the club can get one of these scales in their region to get this data. And we're also hoping eventually to sort of help Wayne um, make this live. Right now, it, basically collects the data and once a year we update the data or he updates the data we're hoping to make that live so it's I agree it's really exciting I think you're going to hear a lot more about it this time next year here's here's a, a really good sort of question slash point that's that's being made and and I guess it's worth noting that last year was really the the first year that we this was done on a grand scale is that right Absolutely. Yeah, and, we did a pilot in Pennsylvania. Yeah, Beautiful. and 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 these these results are really just now making it out. Of course, the the plan is to make it much quicker in in the deployment of those results. But here's the question: Do you expect that beekeepers change man management practice after participating uh, in this survey and seeing some of these results? And and do you then think that that might change the results significantly for next year? So. We've got people tuning in this evening that saw some of that information and say, well, gosh, I'm going to try and use that product. And, and as, that re as those results get out there, are you, you think you might see a skewing? Well, yeah, actually, we're, we're certainly hoping that it's a skewing. Again, this is not a, this is not a, it's not a random survey. This is, we're looking at the people participating in our survey, and we're looking for what works and what doesn't based on where survivorship. So, one of the things that it's taken a long time to do is because we've been trying to automate this process and now that we've got that automation done basically I did the analysis by hand then we had an epidemiologist use SAS to do it I then I, I I I wrote out how I did it gave it to a computer programmer he came up with results and then that was checked by an epidemiologist and so now that we know the system works we're hoping that within two months we're going to give out the results from this up this next year's management survey. So it's going to be much quicker. Absolutely, we're hoping that that's going to inform beekeepers' management decisions. And so what we're hoping to see is a decrease in mortality. Um, one of the questions we're obviously going to ask next year is did you use our management survey results from the previous year to inform your decision making? And hopefully those who did are going to lose fewer colonies than those who didn't. So yeah, absolutely, we're hoping this is going to to influence how people make management decisions. That's the whole idea, is to reduce how many colonies are lost in this country. Great. Um, this, this, you'll like this question, I think. Um, how is the BIP funded? And if an individual or organization wanted to contribute, um, how would one do that? So you've got money being thrown at you, Dennis. Yes, um, well, that's great, because that's exactly, we want to be making sure that this is completely self-sustaining after the five years of, of funding. So we have five years of funding from the USDA NIFA, um, and that funding is helping us build this infrastructure. But as soon as this year, we're going to have a donate button. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, it says my audio connection has been lost. Um, so so as, as, as soon as, as this year, uh, we're going to have a donate button at the website, so as soon as people see if this is valuable, we're going to ask them to make donations there. Um, also, if a group of people want to get uh, a tech transfer team together, we're going to have a model for how they model for how they can do that and fund that, and then have a tech transfer team help service their area. So we're very conscious of the need to be self-sustaining and not reliant on government to keep this going. 
And so it's, it's our, our economic team is actually charged with developing a business model this coming year so that we can implement that. So it will be very, very clear. Right now, PAM, Project APIS Melifra, is acting as our sister organization and sort of helping us with, with as a bank. So they've opened a special bank account for us where any of these donations get placed and then they distribute them until we have set up uh, formal business. Um, this this next question: um, Have you pushed cert, per, have you pushed participation in the survey through the state beekeeping associations? They are typically networked with local associations and can push help push participation through them and across their states. I think we you've certainly been trying that, and and I'll just try the the folks that are listening this evening because again I know that there's the the president of of a, a state association and a vice president and a master beekeeper that's very vocal in her state listening in as well as numerous others that can do that and we're hoping that 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 does happen but have you had any concerted efforts Dennis to to try and work that avenue so absolutely. So when we release this, and again, we've now compiled a list of 400 contacts with local and state organizations. And what we're trying to do with those organizations is once every two months, send them an article that they can put on their website or they can put in their local newsletters. But we also send it out when we, really, we did this last year, and we're certainly going to do it again this year. We send out an email to those presidents saying, we're doing the survey please get your memberships to participate and send that out. So we really are pushing that this year. We're also hoping that as we push the results, that participation becomes much more meaningful. I, I know that a lot of people get frustrated. All these surveys and they don't see results. So we're very, very attuned to the fact that we want to make sure that the beekeepers are getting the results back. And so we're going to really focus on that. And, and so if I wanted to be added to that list of, of someone that you would reach out to, or maybe I'm in charge of my association's newsletter and would be interested in publishing that, um, that information that you're releasing, how would I go about making sure that I'm on that list? Right. So if you go to our, the, the best thing to do would be to, if, if you want to get involved, you sign up to participate and then you'll get this, the email to participate. Otherwise, you can contact us. I'm just looking for the contact us page. So you can email me directly, um, or you can email our project manager. And um, it's a good question. I don't see where you would get those people's email address. So you can email me, or you can email Karen Rock or Renich, um, or And so we will make sure that that information gets on this website really soon. And so, um, what do I have permission? Um, I know Karen's tuning in. Do I have permission to publish that uh, email address so people can contact you, Karen? Yes. If you just post that, yeah, you're you're giving my giving me permission to post Karen's email address. Well, it's a work address. Yeah, she'll okay. contact you with the email address. But it, so, it is here somewhere. I just can't find it. But there's a, there's a way of contacting us. Okay. So we'll make sure that you can do that, and then we can get you on that list, absolutely. Well, what I'll do is um, there's always follow-up emails associated with these webinars. I'll put that information in that follow-up email, as well as a link to the uh, the survey in that follow-up email, because it's not live yet, so so we can't you can't connect to it, but it will be live at the end of this week. Um, one uh, Another question is, once you sign up to participate, and I, so I, I sign up, I take the survey this year, um, and um, will I have to sign up again each year? No. Okay. No, unless you change your email address, no. You'll 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 be on until you ask not to be. Okay. So once you sign up, you're on that list unless you unsubscribe. Right. And um, for those of you that may be interested, um, Karen did just post a question saying, "Feel free to send my email." And so I'm actually sending that out through the question panel right now, and I'll, I'll also include it in the um, the follow-up email. So you should all be getting that uh, through the question panel now, um, so you can see that it's usbsurvey at gmail .com. And again, I'll I'll send that out in follow-up email, so you all have that. Um, 
I, I, I've sort of lost track a little bit of, of where I was. Um, there's lots of questions uh, here, Dennis, about sort of are you looking at this, are you looking at that? Um, is that something that, would you like me to send those questions off to you so that you can see uh, if someone's got an idea about something that, that maybe sure. should be included in the survey? Okay. Sure, we can I don't, do I don't that. want I don't want to necessarily I, go through um, right. all of them here because the list is quite extensive. Um, okay, and I just want to emphasize something there that's really important because I get this question a lot. It's really important to realize that we're not looking to see if something works and something doesn't work. All we're doing is seeing the people who used something, whether they had increased survivorship compared to those who didn't. So those are two very different questions. Okay. And so a lot of people ask questions, well, are you looking to see the effect of honeybee healthy on nosema? And no, we're not. What we're looking at is did we see a difference in people who used honeybee healthy and their survivorship compared to those who didn't use honeybee healthy? Great. Would donations to be informed be tax deductible? <laughs> well, yeah, right now, because they go to Pam, they okay. would be. So contact Karen at that address, and she can give you the details. Basically, you want to send the check payable to Pam to Karen, and then Karen will get deposit in the Pam account. And how that works then is we have a financial committee that will distribute it like a Pam grant, and so that doesn't get charged overhead and everything, too. So it's a way of making sure that that we really didn't want this to be owned by any particular university. We wanted to be in the control of beekeepers, and so that's why we're working so closely with Pam for this. And and Pam is not a person, right? Who is no, Pam? No, sorry, Pam. Pam is Project Apis Mellifera. Okay. Basically, they're an organization set up. They they basically they ask for volunteer donations from people pollinating almonds. So they ask a dollar a hive for the the beekeeper and a dollar a hive from the almond producer. And then they give out really good research grants. They're one of the most progressive um, bee organizations we have because they fund a lot of cutting-edge research with 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 minimal bureaucracy. And so they're really a, a, a really a forward-thinking organization. And so we're really glad to be partnering with them. They've been very supportive um, to our work, and and hopefully we can help them do their work as well. Fantastic. Um, we're we're a little after eight o'clock here, Dennis, and and I, I like to be um, very conscientious when it uh, comes to other people's time, uh, especially uh, someone as busy as you. I know that you're extremely busy and, and pulled in many different directions. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you tremendously for being here with us this evening, taking the time to share this project, and and before I I turn it over to you one last time, I just again like to chide all the individuals listening that um, this is really we all have a vested interest in this if we're beekeepers we have a vested interest in participating in this survey because the more we do uh, the the better the results are going to be and the more more things that Dennis and his crew can do with those results so please spread the word there's lots of questions here about will this webinar be available uh, after this evening it will I'm gonna try very hard to get it uploaded either tonight or tomorrow morning to our website brushy mountains video library uh, which is in our be educated section if you are a key person in association or state Feel free to download that, copy it, bring it to a meeting, uh, share this information, do with it as you please. It will also be up, I think, uh, I um, hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but I know that Karen requested a copy of this uh, webinar as well to put up on Be Informed's website, so I'll certainly uh, send that off as quickly as I can so it can be up there as well. Please uh, get the, the word out because it's it's really got benefit. And so, Dennis, Thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd, you'd like to add here before we part ways? No, and thank you very much for this. I mean, and thanks for everybody who, who stayed on. Um, this was really good, and so um, please do get the word out there. I'm really excited about this. I really think we can make a difference, and I say we really in the sense that we all need to be involved in it. So thanks, thanks for participating, and thanks for spreading the word. Thank you. And again, Dennis, one last time, the survey is open when? It's going to be open March 30th, we hope. We're doing the last beta testing right now, and so it'll be open on March 30th, and it will be open until, I think, the 20th. 
Excellent. April 20th. April 20th, but it'd be best if you got right in there and don't uh, don't put it off and, and forget about it. So just jump right in there as soon as it opens up and, uh, and fill out that survey. So Dennis, uh, with that, thank you again. I appreciate it. Um, best of luck on the survey and we look forward to seeing the results uh, after you compile two years worth of information. Great. Thank you. Good night. Thanks everyone else. Good night. Good night.